Stand with me, will you, as we read God's word one more time from Isaiah 53, beginning in verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that is before its shears is silent. So he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit found in his mouth. Yet, it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Let's pray. Our Father, only your Holy Spirit can open this word to us. So we pray now that you will remove all the distractions that um, come in upon us, all the thoughts of what we're going to do the rest of the day, the family that's coming, the meal we're going to have, the problems we face at work tomorrow, the family issues that haven't gone away, the bereavement that has occurred in some cases, the troubles that seem overwhelming even the good things that we anticipate. Remove them all, Father, so that there is room for the few moments that we have together for you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Saw a cartoon not long ago. It depicted a uh, senior home. And they're not all necessarily like this, but uh, many of them are somewhat similar. There was uh, an older man sitting there facing the wall. The window next to him had the shades drawn. Uh, there was several people in the background, but they were all of kind of the same mind. You know, he had a newspaper that had just fallen out of his hands. Everybody looked relatively dejected and certainly inactive. And one guy was sitting on a couch. He said to a fellow who was sitting in a chair next to him, he said, you know, last week, I think I had a near-life experience. <laughs> I think we all realized that, you know, it's kind of scary that we're headed that direction, right? We kind of fear what the end is. We feel pretty good today, but we know that down the line, there's going to be this phase of life. But the thing that I want to talk about this morning and, and, and turn our attention to is the fact that this can be true of us spiritually as well. It was true of two disciples of Jesus that you may recall that were on the road from Jerusalem to their home in Emmaus in Luke 24. This was happening the Sunday after Jesus had been crucified on Friday. They had very long faces. Everything that they had put their hope and trust in for now and for eternity had been pulled right out from under them. And then suddenly as they're walking along, Jesus is right there with them. They don't recognize him. They don't know that this is Jesus. And Jesus is kind of, he's a little bit tough on them. Because he says to them in Luke 24, verse 25, he says, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? In essence, this stranger to them is saying to them, listen, guys, you think you're Hopes have been crushed, but don't you realize that he was crushed so that your hopes can live? It's, it's all right there. It's in your Bible if you just looked, but you, but you didn't believe what it was telling you the whole time. You know, I used to think Jesus was a little hard on those guys. Because when you think about it, if I were to ask you this morning, where do you find the death of Christ in the Old Testament? Maybe you'd be able to find, find that somewhere. 
If I said, where do you find the resurrection of Christ in the Old Testament? Maybe you'd be able to find it, but I bet even fewer would be able to. It, we think it's hard to find, right? That's what I thought. And then it occurred to me, you know what? That's not true. It's all there, everywhere. It's there everywhere. It's there in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve first sin and, and they cover themselves, they cover their guilt with fig leaves and God comes along and he sacrifices an animal so that he can give them a covering that comes from him showing that the guilt of sin requires a substitutionary sacrifice. It's there in the case of Abraham when God says to Abraham, I want you to sacrifice your son and Abraham in faithfulness to God takes him out and he's, he's about to sacrifice him, has the knife ready to plunge into his heart and God stops him and gives him a, a lamb, a, a goat that's, that, that's stuck in the branches behind him showing once again that substitutionary sacrifice is the right covering for sin. It's there in the Passover story so that when the firstborn of all the people Egyptians as well as Israelites are forfeit. God says, but I will pass over if I see the blood of a sacrificial lamb. Resurrection from a sacrifice. It's there in the story of Jonah. When he's three days in the belly of this great fish and then is suddenly resurrected and delivered to newness of life because God has chosen to bring him out of that. It's there in Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53 where we read about death by crucifixion hundreds of years before that was even known about. God's saying the Messiah will be, will have to die. He will be crucified, in fact. That's the way he will die. But it's the same Messiah who is identified in Daniel 7 as being the Son of Man who will have dominion forever. Death and resurrection is all over the Old Testament. And it's there, beloved, it's there in a single verse in Isaiah 53, verse 10. Now, I'm guessing that if I asked you this morning, give me the gospel in a single verse, most of you who know a little bit about the Bible at least would say, sure, John 3, 16, right? Many of us, I hope, I would love to think all of us, Memorize that somewhere along the line, perhaps as a child. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. John 3, 16, there it is, the gospel in one verse. But Isaiah 53, 10, I'm sure some of you are saying, Dave, are you sure? <laughs> yes, I'm sure. It's there. And it's beautiful. It's beautiful. And I want us to look at that verse this morning and kind of unpack it because the truths that are there are, are so wonderful for all of us. Now, if you look at this verse carefully, you will see that the, that the verse has bookends. It talks about the will of God at the beginning of the verse, and it talks about the will of God at the end of the verse. So obviously that's prominent in this verse. But in between there's a little bit of us and a whole lot of Jesus Christ. And if you recall, in the earthly ministry of Jesus, if you've read through some of the Gospels, and particularly if you've read the Gospel of John, you know that Jesus continually referred to what? As the driving force in his life. The will of the Father, right? The will of the Father. I'm doing the will of the Father. I'm doing what the Father wants me to do. It's the will of the Father that drove him constantly. And here is the will of the Father 700 years ahead of time predicted by Isaiah before Jesus ever arrived on the scene. Jesus' disciples should have known it. This verse tells us the price of salvation. This verse being, begins with inexplicable horror, but it ends in unimaginable glory because that's the gospel. The gospel in miniature in the Old Testament. And I want us to see five ways that the will of God is implemented in the life of Christ that is absolutely critical to every one of us. Because we're here too, and we're actually the thing that drives all of this. 
Number one, it was the will of the Father that the Son be crushed. It was the will of the Father that the Son be crushed. Yet it was the will of the Father, the verse says, to crush him. He has put him to grief. I mean, you read that, and if you're thinking, you'd be saying, wow. What kind of father would want to crush his own son? I mean, the worst father we could think of wouldn't do that, right? And yet this verse is telling us that the father, it was his will to crush his son. That should tell us something right off the bat. That should tell us that there must be some absolutely inexplicably and compelling reason that this had to be the case, right? No father is going to sacrifice his son unless there's an unavoidable reason why this has to happen. This must not, whatever he's trying to accomplish must not be accomplishable in any other way. And in fact, when we come to the second point, we'll see that. But first, there's a couple things we need to see about this phrase. The first one is, I want you to see that the death of Christ was the Father's idea. It was the Father's idea. It was not a tra some tragic accident of history that Jesus just happened to be at the wrong place at the wrong time and the planets converged and all of a sudden he's killed just like Kennedy or Lincoln or somebody else. That's not what the death of Christ was all about. The death of Christ, beloved, was the idea of the Father. I realize that there is a sense in which it was the idea of the Jewish people who conspired against him, right? And they will be held accountable, the Bible tells us. The Romans had something to do with the death of Christ, and they will be held accountable. But it was not primarily this kind of three-year plan that those men who were jealous of Jesus put into effect that led to his death. It was the eternal plan of an infinite father that led to the death of Christ. You know, in that we see something that's kind of amazing that when you begin to study the Bible, you see it almost on every page. That is the sovereignty of God, the plan of God being worked out through the free will, the free choice of men. And that's what happened here. Tur turn with me to Acts chapter 2, because I want you to see how Peter used this in the very first sermon that kind of inaugur inaugurated the church. Peter's talking about the death of Christ, because these were the very people who seven weeks before had been culpable in this death of Christ. And Peter describes it this way, seven weeks after Jesus' death, Acts 2, verse 33. He says, this Jesus was delivered up according to the, now watch this, according to the definite plan of foreknowledge of God. It wasn't according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of the Jewish people or the Romans or somebody else. It was the, it was the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. But what's the next phrase? You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. You were the lawless men. God planned it, but you executed it. And so you have the blood of God on your hands. Is it any wonder that 3,000 of those people turned to Christ, came to faith in Christ on that very day? And it wasn't a few days later, and the Bible tells us 5,000 more of them came to faith in Christ because they, began, they knew there was an empty tomb on the other end of town. And what Peter was saying had to be true. So the death of Christ was a very purposeful, very meaningful, very intentional event planned by God the Father before time began. I'll tell you something else about it. It was a painful event. It was a painful event. You know, we think about, when we think about the death of Christ, we think about the suffering of Christ, right? And the suffering of Christ was unimaginable. But imagine the Father who asked his son to do this. I've heard people say, oh, how could God be so cruel, the father, to send his son to do this? And they haven't thought this through. No father would send his son to do something like this without suffering the same kind of pain and anguish and maybe even worse, right? It pained the father to send the son to this kind of crucifixion, to this death. Remember David? Remember how David's son Absalom conspired to take the kingdom away from him? 
You may remember that when word came to David that his son Absalom had been finally killed, putting the rebellion down, here's what the Bible tells us about David in 2 Samuel 18, verse 33. It says, And the king was deeply moved, and he went up to his chamber over the gate, and he wept, and he said, Oh, my son, Absalom, my son, my son, Absalom, would that I have died instead of you, Absalom, my son, my son. That didn't just come out of nowhere, beloved. That came because we have the capability to have broken hearts because the God the Father in whose image we are made has the capability to have broken hearts. And if David's heart was broken over this wayward, rebellious son, imagine how God the Father felt about the death of his absolutely perfect son. We mistake if we think that this didn't hurt both father and son. And if we don't understand that this, therefore, could have been for not just for no reason, there had to be a reason that the father sent his son to this kind of death. And that leads us to the second point. It was the father's will that he be guilty. And if you're not back there, turn again to Isaiah 53. It was the father's will that he be guilty. Second phrase, when his soul makes an offering for guilt. We're kind of going pretty rapidly from bad to worse here, right? But now at least we know why the father would ask his son to do this, because he's making an offering for guilt. He's making payment for guilt. But, now, but whose guilt? It couldn't have been his. If you study the life of Christ in the Gospels, you realize how sinlessly perfect he was. And in case we don't get the message, he tells us in Hebrews 4.15 that he absolutely was without sin, so it could not have been his guilt that he was making payment for. So whose guilt? And of course, the answer is the guilt that belongs to me. The guilt that belongs to you the guilt that belongs to everyone who will ever believe and come to faith in Jesus Christ. It was their guilt that he was taking on on the cross. Now, where does guilt come from? Our society would like to say, there's no such thing as guilt. It's just an imagination, and you need to get over it. The Bible would say, you got, you got guilt because you have sin. It's real. The guilt is real. The guilt is proper. The guilt is appropriate. It's what God has built into your life. And where did, where did sin come from in the first place? From, from our ancient ancestors, Adam and Eve, right? And the Bible teaches us that when they sinned, they incurred the guilt and the death that had been promised by God if they were to disobey his most simple of commands. And so they incurred that guilt and they, in, they incurred that separation from God because that's what death in its ultimate sense is. It's a separation. And that wonderful fellowship that they had had with God up until that point on a daily basis was suddenly gone. It was cut off. They ran away from God instead of running to God. Separation, alienation became a part of the history of every person who's ever lived. We're alienated from God. We're alienated from each other. We're alienated from nature. We're alienated from our own selves. If you don't believe it, just try and do what it is you think you want to do for the next week and see how well you succeed. Alienation, guilt, suffering. And it's all illustrated by the sword that God puts at the, at the gate when he dismisses Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden, the sword that he puts there. Remember in Genesis 2. Why? Because God is saying, you've been dismissed from this garden and because of death you've incurred guilt and the only way back is through the sword. Which means that the only way back is through death. So how did Jesus make an offering for guilt? You say, by dying. And that would be true, right? Jesus in his death According to the Bible, is paying for the sin of the world. Back in verse 6, we saw that God has laid on him the iniquity of us all. We've incurred guilt by going our own way instead of God's way. God laid the payment on him. 
Jesus is the, you know, what is he? He's the, he's the fulfillment of all those millions of lambs and goats and bulls that were sacrificed over the years from the time that God gave the law to Moses until the time of Christ, 1,500 years later. And all of those sacrifices were ineffective in the sense that the blood of bulls and goats can never take away sin. It just symbolized what was going to happen when Christ came. So what the, what the, what the lambs and the, and the bulls and the goats symbolized, Christ actually accomplished. It's true. There is payment for guilt in the person of Christ. And it does happen by dying. That, and that's good. But to really understand this, we're going to have to go another level deeper. There's another level to this. Who killed Jesus? Men killed Jesus, right? The Jews hatched the plot, condemned him. The Roman soldiers drove in the nails and men killed Jesus. But note the phrase, note the phrase again that we just read. Yes, it was the, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. So men killed him, but who crushed him? Who put him to grief? The Father. It was the Father who put him to grief. Well, well what's that all about? Well, it's about this, beloved, that, that Jesus didn't just die physically. He didn't just die physically to make payment for our sin. He died spiritually as well. Notice his soul. His soul makes an offering for guilt. Soul, the Hebrew word nephesh, which means breath or life principle. Picture, picture Adam lying there on the ground, you know, having been formed out of the dust. But what's he doing? Nothing. Until what? Until God breathed into his nostrils the breath, nephesh, of life, and he became a living nephesh, he became a living soul, the animating part of him. And that's what this passage says made the payment for sin. So it was the totality of Jesus' person that made payment for sin. And while men killed him physically, it was the Father. Grab this, Beloved, it was the Father who crushed him. It was the Father who brought him to grief. It was the Father who separated from him. So that we get that statement of Jesus on the cross that crushed him when he said, my God, my God, not my Father. He had always called him Father. This is the only time in the New Testament that Jesus refers to God as anything other than Father. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The Father has faded in the background. He's now suffering the wrath of God against sin. Because he has become sin for us, the Father has forsaken him. It was the anticipation. It was the anticipation of this event that drove Jesus almost to despair in the anguish of Gethsemane before he went to the cross. This is how Jesus' soul made an offering for sin. But now, I gotta take you one more level. Okay, we don't have time to look at it, but if you check out sometime Leviticus chapter five, verse one, I know it's your favorite book in the Bible. <laughs> Leviticus five, verse one, through chapter six, verse seven, you will find the guilt offering described in detail. The guilt offering is described there, which is what Jesus is doing on the cross. And the Old Testament scholar Alec Mochier summarizes that teaching. And here's what he says. He says, the heart of the distinctiveness of the guilt offering is its insistence on minute exactness between sin and remedy. Minute exactness between sin and remedy. He says it could legitimately be called the satisfaction offering. So what this passage is affirming is that Jesus suffered, quote Mocher again, exactly equivalent to what needed to be done. Okay, so now let me try and bring this home. What this means is that if my sin incurred to me the penalty of eternal separation from God, which it did, and if your sin 
incurs the penalty of eternal separation from God, which it does, and if the sin of every other person who will ever believe and trust in Christ as Savior incurs the penalty of eternal separation from God, which it does, this means that on the cross, beloved, in that moment of time, this infinite sacrifice suffered billions of eternities of separation from his Father to make payment for sin. It's an unbelievable thought. And when Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, that he made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him, it was no small thing. Billions of eternity, something inexpressible happened on Calvary. And here's the thing I kind of want you to get your arms around. It wasn't just the Son. It was Father and Son acting in harmony. Father and Son acting in harmony to take our guilt. One becoming sin for us, and the other expending all of his judgment and wrath upon his Son for us so that the sin could be paid for. So Father and Son are separated in relationship in order to make this happen, but they are absolutely united in purpose to make this happen. Given that image, beloved, can you imagine someone saying, no thanks, I'm good enough, I can make it on my own, I'm better than my neighbor, so I know I'm okay. Sorry you went to all that trouble for nothing. Do you get the point of hell? Hell would be too good for that attitude, would it not? And yet that's what the majority of our friends and neighbors and most of the world is saying. Believe me, God did not crush his son for nothing any more than you would crush your son or daughter for nothing. This means that this was the only way it could happen. This means that when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father except through me, he meant that exactly. There's nobody else who did this. There's no one else who could remove the sword from the entrance to paradise. Only Jesus. Only Jesus. And the horror of that whole thing is almost inexplicable. It's the, but it's the only way back. It's the only way back. Thirdly, it was the Father's will that he be resurrected. It was the Father's will that he be re resurrected. Finally, the horror is going to start to turn to glory, right? At least for those who will believe. Life out of death, resurrection. Where do you see that in the next phrase? He shall see his offspring. How can a dead man see his offspring? He can't. This is resurrection. He's risen. And to make sure we get the point, the prophet adds, under the inspiration of God, he shall prolong his days. Look like his days were over with? Guess again. Three days later, he's alive and living again, and his days are prolonged forever. Having been crushed by the Father, he is now raised by the Father. Now, I'll grant you, this is, it's not blatant here. It's not in your face. It's subtle because to God, this is no big deal. But the resurrection is here inexplicably, and that's why Jesus accused his disciples of being slow of heart to believe all that the Scripture said. You miss a lot if you don't dive into the details. You might, you might even miss the resurrection like those guys did, and you don't want to miss that. Everything hinges on the resurrection. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 14, and if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is vain. And your faith is vain. He's acknowledging this is the linchpin of Christianity. It's not, oh, maybe it was, maybe it wasn't, doesn't really matter. It matters totally. If Jesus was not raised bodily from the dead, then Christian, Christianity is a lie. And there is no redemption. There is no atonement. There is no forgiveness. There is no hope. 
It all comes from the resurrection. The resurrection is God the Father stamping approved over the work of the Son, right? And believe me, he hasn't stamped approved over anything you've done or I've done or anybody else has done, but he stamps approved over the resurrection, over the work of Jesus Christ in the resurrection. He's saying, yes, the payment is made. Yes, it's adequate. Yes, it's accepted. Yes, there is redemption. There is atonement. There is forgiveness. There is hope. This is what separates Christianity from every other faith in the world. This is what makes it real. Other religions have claims. We have proof. Other religions have maybe. We have certainty. Other religions have religion. We have relationship. They have men in the flesh. We have God in the flesh. They have dead founders. We have a living Savior. They have lies. We have the way, the truth, and the life. They have rules. We have Jesus. Do you see that it's, we're not talking the same thing here? Totally different because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And years ago, there was, a, there was a devastating earthquake in China, early part of the 20th century. It dislodged a huge boulder from the side of a mountain. And when they got digging around in the rubble, they found out that it had uncovered a huge cache of artifacts from a previous age, thousands of years ago. And so suddenly a whole new world opened up that nobody had known anything about prior to that. The movement, the dislodging of the boulder, Opened up a whole new world, just like, beloved, when the stone rolled away from the tomb of Jesus Christ. A whole new world opened up. A world where death doesn't win. It doesn't have to. A world where forgiveness is available. A world where injustice will all be made right. A world where perfection reigns. Crucifixion was no small thing and neither was the resurrection. A whole new day opened up with the resurrection. You know that when the, when, the, when the women came to the tomb, remember they met those two angels there and the angels said, what, what are you looking for? Are you looking for Jesus? He isn't here. You're looking in the wrong place. You won't find him among the dead. He's among the living. Don't you remember he told you he was going to go to Galilee. Go up there and you'll see him. It's a new day. It's a new world. And the angel might. We don't have any record that he did. But he might have just turned to the soldiers. If they were still there and said, and by the way, you should be afraid. You should be really afraid. Because everything that your world is based on has just been shaken to the core by the resurrection. Beloved, nobody, nobody, now listen carefully, nobody can come to the empty tomb and walk away the same. The empty tomb says it's decision time. You either get on board with the Lord Jesus Christ who is the way, the truth, and the life or you reject him to your own detriment. But you can't walk away unscathed. It was the Father's will he be resurrected forth. It was the Father's will that he have offspring. It was the Father's will that he have offspring. That's the point of the whole thing, isn't it? To save sinners. This is where we enter the picture. It was to produce offspring. The Son of God died and rose again so that he could bring other sons and daughters to God. Remember how John said, Jesus came to his own and his own received him not, but as many as did receive him, those who believed in his name, to them he gave the power to become the children of God. Tells us in Hebrews that he's, not a, that he's not ashamed to call those who believe in him his own brothers and sisters. Credible. He's done this because the Father willed that he be crushed. The Father willed that he be a sin offering and the Father willed that he be raised again. And that's why Romans 10, 10 9 says, because if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, if you confess with your mouth, the Lord Jesus, I believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. He's defeated death. It just remains for us to accept the gift of eternal life. 
so much goes with this. Let me just illustrate with a simple little story. Philip Riken, who was at the time, he's president of Wheaton College now, but he was president, he was a pastor of the famous 10th Avenue Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia at the time. And he said a woman, a woman came to the church and she came to faith in Christ, but she had a very troubled background. She had, you know, seeking her God was pleasure and she was taking it wherever she could find it. And, and so when she came to Christ, she was ashamed of that past. And even though she believed that Jesus died to forgive her sins and she had given them to Christ, she just, she, she kept condemning herself. She couldn't get past this. So someone finally told her one day, they said to her, Kay, don't, don't you get it? When God the Father looks at you, he doesn't say, there goes that slut. He says, there goes my beloved daughter. That's different, right? But that's what it means to come to faith in Christ. It means to have healing. It means to have it means to have his righteousness become yours. It means to have forgiveness. It means to have cleansing. That's why it was the Father's will to crush him. So we need not be crushed. You can't put Jesus' death aside, though, and earn that. All you can do is accept it. That's all you can do. Fifthly, it was the Father's will that they live forever. This story has a happily ever after ending for those who come to faith in Christ. See it there again, he shall prolong his days, that's eternal life. <clears throat> it's hinted at in the previous phrase, he shall see his offspring, that implies a resurrection, yes, but it also implies eternal life. How many of your offspring do you hope to see? Probably your children. If you're fortunate, your grandchildren, and if you're really fortunate, maybe your great-grandchildren, right? After that, good luck. You're not going to see them, right? I, until I did a genealogy study a couple of years ago, I didn't know the names of my ancestors beyond my grandparents. I knew one great-grandfather. That was it. I didn't know any of the rest of them. And believe me, a hundred years from now, your descendants, those <laughs> most precious to you and most dependent on you for life, aren't even going to know your name. It's just a fact of life. What the Bible is telling us here is Jesus knows those who are his. He'll see them all. He's alive and they will be alive forever. Paul says this in, in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9. He says, God saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, and which has now been manifested through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death, and listen to this, and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Imagine that, eternal life with God for all believers. And Isaiah saw it all 700 years before Jesus ever came. Now let me close with this. The will of the Father, which is at the beginning of the verse and it's the end of the verse, was not easy for Jesus, was it? Not easy, not even a little bit. And yet, Isaiah can say the will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. And we know, looking back on it, it did. He accomplished exactly what the will of the Father was for him to do. Here's the unanswered question this morning. How is the will of God doing in your hands? Is the will of God prospering in your hands? Or is the will of God being denied in your hands? What is the will of God for you? Peter says it. It's said in many places in the Bible, but Peter says in 2 Peter 3, verse 9, he says, this is what God is wishing, or literally the word is willing. And all should come to repentance and that none should perish. Have you come to repentance? That's the will of God. That's the will of God. 
to come to repentance, is to take advantage of what he has bought for you at great cost to both father and son. Close of a service one day, a pastor whose name was Dr. Stearns, Dr. D.M. Stearns, got a criticism. Somebody came up to him and said, I, don't, I, don't, I didn't like your preaching. He said, well, what didn't you like? He said, I don't like what you're preaching about Christ, the idea of Christ dying for the lost. Don't you realize that is, that's, I mean, that's, that's out of date. That kind of thinking, that kind of process that Jesus would die for the lost. Preach Jesus as teacher and as example. Dr. Stearns was a lot smarter than I would have been because what he said was, okay, if I preach Jesus as example, will you follow him? And the man says, yeah, I would. And so he said, okay, let's start with this. Step one, 1 Peter 2.22 tells us that Jesus had no sin. Are you ready to follow him there? And the man said, well, you know, I, I know I sin. That's not the point. And Stearns said, yeah, that, that's exactly the point. Because see, if you can't follow him there, you don't need a teacher and you don't need an example. You need a savior. That's what we all need. That's why Jesus came. That's why the Father crushed him. That's why the Father made him an offering for sin. That's why the Father raised him again. So that we could have that Savior. And I pray that you have that Savior so that it's not a near life experience. Oh, beloved, don't come this close and miss it. Have a new life experience. Give your life to Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. This word, the gospel in one verse in the Old Testament, it's all there. So thankful, Lord, for what you've done. If there's one heart, Lord, if there's more than one heart, I'm sure there are hearts here today that have never truly reached out to you. Some of them think they have and haven't. Others know they haven't. Whatever the condition, Father, by your Holy Spirit, will you prompt them? Please, to let this be the day, what better day than Easter, to celebrate a new life in Christ. And then, Father, having invited you in, help them to come and talk to us so that we can give them some literature so that we can help them in the new walk of faith in Christ. Lord, we thank you for this wonderful celebration that we have, not of death, but of life in Jesus Christ. Thank you in his name. Amen.